together. Another year is dawning. Dear Father, let it be. Join with us as we sing together, please. Another year. together. Father God, we are grateful to have this opportunity um, to uh, gather in in homes as we worship virtually together. Uh, We're thankful for technology that allows us to do this. Um, God, we uh, give thanks for your goodness to us and uh, God, that this morning we know and trust that you are going to uh, speak through your word and that you are going to uh, grow us and mature us, and we give thanks for that. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, it is good to uh, be able to be with you. I know it's a little bit different uh, this week, and uh, we uh, look forward to uh, what God is going to do in uh, this time together that we have. Uh, just a couple of announcements. Uh, first, we, we do plan on, on meeting in person next week, uh, so things will... Uh, be back to normal on campus uh, as we've taken a couple of weeks off just to kind of get through whatever potential issues would result from holiday gatherings. Um, we will continue to update that as we as we move through the week, but we, we plan on meeting in person next week. Um, also, uh, just know that uh, as we meet next Sunday that there will be a, a budget discussion at 5 o'clock here in the sanctuary. Uh, and then the vote on that will be the following week. Uh, some other church business that we are working on as well, you'll get some update on that uh, here in the, in the next uh, couple of days as we work through nailing down some things for the coming year. I also want to uh, remind you to continue to be praying for the Lewis family. Uh, there is a funeral service at 2 o'clock here today. Um, we are going to be live streaming that, and so we encourage you to take advantage of that. Um, as well. Uh, but continue to pray for them. Also pray for the family of, of Chuck and Donna Young as, as Chuck is in the hospital. Um, and we'll update you as we have more information on that as well. Um, but we are, we're glad to have this opportunity to, to worship together. And we give thanks uh, for this opportunity. Let's continue to, to worship. What a fellowship. What a joy divine. Leaning on the everlasting arms of Jesus. What a fellowship, what a joy divine, leaning on the everlasting arms. What a blessedness, what a peace is mine, leaning on the everlasting arms. Leaning, leaning, safe and secure from all alarms. Everlasting 
everlasting arms. Oh, how sweet to walk in this pilgrim way, leading on the everlasting arms. Oh, how bright the path grows from day to day, leading on the everlasting arms. Leading, leading, safe and secure from all alarms. Well, good morning, church family. Uh, over the uh, the internet this morning with you guys, we're we'll jumping back into our series over in the book of First Peter. We're in chapter five today. We're we'll going to be covering just a few verses. <coughs> if you would go ahead and find your place over there, and together we'll uh, we'll work our way through the passage. Uh, this morning, I want to say thank you on uh, behalf of the the Lewis family. Uh, our church is very gracious and very generous. Uh, we have people who clearly love one another the way that the Word of God commands us and tells us to. And so we say thank you very, very much for that. This morning, continuing in our series about being strangers and aliens, those who are merely passing through. This morning, the title of the sermon is The Devil Went Down to Georgia. If you remember, there is a, uh, there's an old song by Charlie Daniels, The Devil Went Down to Georgia. My brother, my sister, and myself uh, discovered that song as children. And now I'll, I'll be very upfront with you and be very clear with you. There is no theological truth within that song about the devil. However, it, it was amusing. And, and to this day, I still remember as a child uh, playing the different parts and, and jumping up and down on the couch, singing that song, being silly with my brother and my sister. Strangely enough, still to this day, I, I know every word to that song, and Jimmy might find that amusing, but it's, it's funny how it seems to be the case. But uh, this morning, we're, we're speaking concerning the devil. Peter is going to address some very specific things concerning Satan. And for us, we're going to begin with just a, a few questions of really recognizing that, 
we have understated sometimes, I think, the power uh, and the existence of Satan. And we don't really have much conversation concerning the reality that he is active and present in seeking to destroy the lives of believers. One of the greatest tricks the devil ever did was convincing the world he didn't exist. This is a quote from long age past. And so I ask you this morning this question. Do you, do you believe in the devil? Do you believe in that which is de- demonic? Do we understand that we don't simply live in a place of just molecules and atoms that are bumping into one another in motion? But that there are rulers and authorities and powers, both demonic and heavenly, that are at work. <coughs> now, I ask you another question. Does that make you a bit uncomfortable having this conversation? Does that strike you as a bit crazy? If I were to, at the end of each service, say, uh, watch out for the devil this week, would you consider that advice strange? Well, one of the more strange things that I believe has happened is that over the, the past several centuries, especially here in the, in the West, in our particular cultural atmosphere, there's been an increasing presupposition that everything can be stripped down to simply cause and effect of material, physical things that are around us. Everything boils down to some type of scientific evidence or atheistic materialism, even to the point of the philosophical viewpoint of nihilism. But the fact that is staring us uh, unavoidably in the face is that we are more than just a massive machine of just cause and effect atoms colliding. It's really a, a a, a silly idea to think that we can boil things down to just that. See... Despite our disenchanted babblings and our folly shrouded by philosophy, our world is oozing with spiritual nuance and spiritual power. There's not a (coughs) single unspiritual corner of the universe. Even in our enlightenment and our rationalism, rather than equipping us to, to deal with reality, those types of thinking have actually left us void and vulnerable to the schemes of the devil. And so our brother Peter this morning would aim to, to fix, to remedy, to deal with that vulnerability. So if you would, join me in chapter 5, beginning in verse 8. We're going to read to verse 11. The Word of God reads like this this morning. Be of sober spirit. Be on the alert. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. But resist him, firm in your faith knowing that the same experiences of suffering are being accomplished by your brethren who are in the world. After you've suffered for a little while, the God of all grace, who called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself perfect, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. To him be dominion forever and ever. Amen. Peter's aiming directly at the schemes of the devil this morning. He's telling us to be aware, and he's going to send us a warning and an an equipping to hopefully stir us to wake up uh, uh, our minds from this sleepwalking distraction that we call the, the culture of this world. And he does this in a few ways. First, in verse 8, he's going to call us to watch soberly in this spiritual cosmos, understanding that there are strategies that this adversary uses. Secondly, in verse 9, he's going to call us to a resistance of our spiritual enemy, and he he tells uh, tells us of a weapon that we'll have. And then finally, he's going to tell us that we set our hope not in the here and now, but in the future. And regardless of our battle record, when we go to war, Jesus is the victorious restorer of fallen troops. So look with me closely at verse 8 this morning. It says, be sober in spirit and be on alert. He tells us to watch soberly. He's giving us principles for war here. What does it mean to watch soberly, to be on watch? Peter uses this language of sobriety in past verses. In chapter 4 and verse 7, he told us to have sober-minded prayer. Well, just as with his previous use... Sobriety here is a reference to the opposite of drunken stupor. It's having a sharp, alert, careful observation, a mind of thoughtful readiness. And so he says, be of sober spirit, be on alert. This part of sobriety is to know the schemes and strategies of the enemy in order for us to be prepared for them. 
It's the same thing that the Apostle Paul does over in 2 Corinthians chapter 2 where he warns us against being ignorant of Satan's schemes lest we be outwitted by him. It's a principle of warfare that we bear in mind security, that we be on watch. It involves being prepared for, <coughs> for battle by knowing the schemes of the evil one and also being able to launch attacks ourselves. If you're in a battle and you think the enemy is preparing a frontal assault, but he's actually coming at your, your left flank, all of the watchfulness of your front lines may prove to be in vain. Unless we know the strategies of the adversary, we can't set an effective watch for his work. And so how do we know when the adversary is working? What are his strategies? What are his schemes? What does his attack look like? Well, there can be a great deal of explanation for this. There can be uh, a whole bunch of different de uh, descriptions and definitions of how this takes place. But we're going to speak to, to four of the strategies that the adversary uses in spiritual attack. And we need to be very aware of them. In this very verse, he, he, he talks about how your adversary, the devil, he calls him an adversary. He attacks through accusation because he is an adversary. He says, your adversary, and he uses this as a, almost a, a legal term from Scripture. It describes the, the kind of a, a prosecutor before God trying to convict of your guilt. In the first two chapters of, of Job, Satan is the accuser of Job before God. He is the adversary. In Zechariah's vision, in, in chapter 3 of, of his book, he speaks about uh, the, the Satan standing next to Joshua, the, uh, the high priest, and accusing him before God. And the demonically inspired masses who, according to the Father and according to Jesus, the, the devil accused Jesus falsely in the court. And when he went to trial on the cross, there was always accusation. See, the adversary works through accusation. Now, you can know he is working when you feel the sharp sting of accusation. Not in the way that drives you to the throne of grace. You know, that kind of accusation that comes along and says, you, you remember what you did? That was despicable. You're worthless. You're disgusting. See, unlike the conviction that the Holy Spirit brings, which moves us from sin to confession to understanding pardon and assurance, this voice of accusation moves us to self-justification or pride or despair or depression. It's either you're a despicable loser, work harder, or you'll be done. We, we see this in pride by trying to just pull ourselves up by our bootstraps. Or it says, you are a despicable person. Look at your weakness, and you despair with a loss of hope. Both of these are a, a, a form of Satan's demonic attacks. These are the way he comes after believers. This is the way he, he seeks to destroy. And so when your mind begins stirring late at night, when you're lying in the bed, and the devil brings his accusations against you, you need to realize that we are called to be on guard. We are called to be of sober spirit and be on alert because our adversary is out for accusing us. Another thing we know that this adversary will do is that he will attack by dis distorting God's word. Let me give you a couple examples of what I mean. In the book of Genesis, Satan uh, opposed uh, Adam and Eve, twisting the word of God when he came to them and saying, did God really say that? Is, that? is that really what he said? He calls them into question. And in the temptation of Christ in the wilderness that we see over in Matthew chapter 4, he quoted scriptures to Christ. Satan quoted scriptures to Christ, and yet he did them with a twist. He twisted God's word in order to take it out of context to try and tempt Jesus. Satan is a twister of the word. He'll twist the scriptures to lead us away from God. So you know that he is working when scriptures are being used wrongly rather than being handled carefully. When so-called Bible teachers use the, use the word of God for their own gain or to manipulate. When priests or popes, uh, they direct people to, to realize that they, can, they can't have access to God unless they come through them like they're a mediator. We set our watch against this mishandling of scripture. And guess what, folks? This means that you, you do this for me, too. Meaning that you open your Bible for yourself and you make sure that your pastor isn't misusing it, isn't misleading you, that you are diving into the Word of God, knowing if, if the Word for yourself, that you might be aware of these schemes that could come against you. It means that your favorite pastor doesn't get a pass either. 
It, it means that you can't say, well, you know, John Piper and, and R.C. Sproul and John MacArthur and, and all of these, you know, David Jeremiah, all these folks who have preached for such a long time, they're, they're trustworthy. No, you need to have the scriptures open before you. The Puritans, the church fathers, they don't get a pass. Scripture is the authority, and that's where we go to to find our source because Satan is into twisting the truth. The third way he often attacks is through physical affliction or desire or weakness. See, it was after Jesus was in the wilderness for 40 days that when he arrived, <coughs> at the end of the time, he was tempted with bread, with food, with sustenance. Paul, according to 1 Corinthians chapter 12, was buffeted by a thorn in the flesh. He called it a messenger of Satan. In Mark chapter 9, in Matthew 12, in Luke uh, at 9, and in Acts 8, there was demonic oppression all over the place that had a physical effect on a variety of people, bringing about physical suffering from deafness and blindness to, to seizures. Yes, the adversary will even use illness or physical affliction. Look at the book of Job. You see, we, my friends, bear the image of God. And the adversary, Satan, the evil one, the devil, he so hates God that that means he hates the very image of God too. And he hates that in us. These demonic doctrines of our culture and of our world that seem to take humanity further and further and further away from the throne of God <coughs> are a clear representation of this taking place. And we, we see humanity's you know, demise and their demolishing of, of life. It's nothing short of demonic graffiti on the very image of God. And so whenever, wherever and whenever we see this wanton destruction and dehumanization of God's image bearers, we are seeing a demonic strategy unfolding amongst us. And so we, we see this in the, in the taking of life. We see this in, in uh, euthanasia. We see this in abortion. We see this all over the place in the destruction of God's very image bearers. Another way that we see the schemes of the devil, the attacks is in the mission-killing discord that is struck among uh, brethren. Mission-killing division, where the devil divides. In Matthew chapter 16, when Jesus is going to be taken to, to be crucified, he, he tells this to the disciples, and what happens? Peter, yes, the very Peter who is the author of this passage, comes and pulls Jesus aside and seeks to rebuke the Savior. God forbid that he would do that, Jesus. But Jesus sees through skin and bone right to the very soul of Peter, realizing that Satan is whispering in his ear. And Jesus says, get behind me, Satan. See, this mission-killing division is the work of Satan. We see this in Paul's ministry as well. Over in 2 Timothy chapter 4, Paul is having a conversation as he pens this letter to Timothy through the inspiration of the Spirit of God, and he speaks of men who would seek to cause conflict and problem and destruction, and that they're doing so as a, as a weapon that, that Satan is using. But the Lord would triumph, and the Apostle Paul would say this, so I was rescued from the lion's mouth, and the Lord will rescue me from every evil deed and bring me safely into his heavenly kingdom. <coughs> so, we see that, that Satan works through division. This can be both inside the church and outside the church. Division am, among the, the brethren is one of the most dangerous schemes that the devil seeks to use to, to be divisive and to tear down and to cause destruction, and this is one of his attacks. So he says, be of sober spirit and be on alert. Be alert, have a, have a mindset of knowing that this is going to take place. This brings us to, to verse 9 where, he would now tell us the, the weapon that he would give us. Because he tells us not only to be on alert, to be on watch, to be on guard, but then he also says in verse 9, but resist him. So there's a resistance. There's an action that we take, and he gives us a weapon, and that is the weapon of faith. Verse 9, he says, look, we resist him, firm in our faith, knowing that the same experiences and sufferings that are being accomplished by our brethren who are in the world. So we're on watch, but we're also actively resisting, knowing that this enemy, as he crashes up against us, that we need to resist. The question is this, though. How on earth would one resist an ancient, immortal, spiritual enemy of incredible power and craftiness? Well, Peter takes the first option directly off the table, and that is the option of our own strength. See, we're not equal to our enemy. We are not equal to the adversary in our bodily form. When he accuses us, 
our own righteousness won't serve as an adequate shield. When he afflicts us, our bodies are but frail. When he divides us, our flesh delights because we are not his equal. So what do we do? How do we fight? Well, Peter answers, we fight by faith, not by strength. Resist him firm in your faith. How are you firm in your faith? What does this mean? Well, what is faith? How does faith resist the, day, the, the devil? See, this isn't an isolated instruction to our spiritual resilience. This is speak, <coughs> spoken of in several places in the New Testament. In Ephesians chapter 6 is one of the most uh, apt places that we can look where we see this taking place. Where Paul pens this and he says, Be strong in the Lord and in strength and might. Put on the whole armor of God that you might be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. And having done all, to stand firm. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith, which you can extinguish the flaming darts of the evil one. So there's this, this big question, how is it that we fight this fight? We resist the, the schemes and the attacks of the adversary by trusting and depending and sheltering in our Lord. We fight by faith. We fight by faith. Our faith is not in our own footing, our faith is in our Father. We have to unpack this. What, what is faith? Well, faith is a trust, a trust that is dependent on something that is outside of ourselves. Faith believes in, in some object that can do what it's meant to do. By faith, the driver in his car will cross the bridge in an interstate, trusting that that bridge is going to hold his car up. By faith, on a regular basis, I will sit down in a chair because I'm, I know that chair is going to hold me up. Faith trusts and depends in something. Faith is an inescapable concept for each and every one of us. We live by it all the time in everything that we do. <clears throat> so when Peter tells you to resist the devil firm in your faith, what object of trust is he referring to? Well, he's referring to the very person and the very promises of God. He says resist the devil by trusting in God's character and in God's word. Do you see how this is connected to the strategies that we've listed above? See, the, the accuser, the adversary will accuse, and we resist by faith. How? Well, instead of believing the accusations, we believe the gospel. Now, this is not saying we don't deny, we, that we deny the very sins that he accuses of and say that they're unreal, but know that we believe that the gospel is true and that those very sins are swallowed up in grace. So by faith, we resist both pride and despair by believing in the gospel. When the adversary twists Scripture and he attempts to anchor our trust in some faulty place, in some false truth, faith, faith will resist by believing in the Word of God. And we do this by knowing the Word of God and spending time in the Word of God that we can be prepared when the adversary comes because we grasp the Word of God, clinging to it by faith. When the adversary attacks our bodies, with illness, with suffering. Faith resists by hoping, hoping in the resurrection, by believing that even in nakedness and famine and sword and peril and death, that the Lord gives no false gifts, that he uses even these things to serve us for our good and for his glory. <clears throat> but what keeps us from this faith-fueled resistance? Well, by trusting in ourselves, and Peter knows this oh so deeply. In Luke 22, Peter three times would deny the Lord, even as the Lord was being led to crucifixion. Well, what happened? See, Peter trusted in himself. He trusted in his own footing and in his own strength. Jesus even warned Peter. He said, Satan has demanded to have you that he might sift you like wheat. This demonic attack, this satanic sifting happened and Peter's denial was indeed sin, but that sin was a result of a failure when the enemy attacked. See, this is spiritual warfare, folks. There is a, a battle that is raging. So when Peter says that your adversary roams around like a lion, seeking whom he may devour, he knows what he's talking about because he has been attacked by this lion. He tried to resist in his own strength, and he utterly failed. But by the Spirit, by grace... 
Jesus would restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish him. Peter even says to him, I mean, Jesus even says to Peter, Satan demanded to have you that he might sift you like wheat, but I have prayed that your faith may not fail, and that when you have turned again, that you'll strengthen your brothers. See, Peter would obey this instruction even as he writes this letter, and we read his words today. Peter did, in fact, deny the Lord, but the Lord did not deny Peter. Resist him so that in the firmness of faith, you have find strength and not in your own physical capabilities. Look, this is sometimes difficult. This is sometimes hard. If, if the apostle Peter, if one who, who it's the one who Jesus said he would build the, the church upon, if he struggled and failed with this, folks, <coughs> we will struggle and fail with this at times too. But Jesus came for blood. You see, the Son came for blood. As we think through all of this, I ask you, is, is all of this reasonable? See, Peter is telling us to, to take sides because this is a war. That we are in a fight to the death, a winner-take-all battle is at hand. And he's saying to us, look, you need to live like Jesus wins this fight. Look, I, I know that each and every one of us, we know the good Sunday school answer. That when we read this, we're like, of course Jesus wins. But what if everything in your, in, your, in your life is telling you otherwise? What if everything is, in culture is telling you otherwise? What if all you see is loss all around you? What if you were one of these Christians in, in 60 AD that you were feeling this growing hatred of those around you because of your faith, because of what you believe? That under this demonic leader, Nero, that, that you could be burned alive for your faith, where you feel this demonic oppression pressing in on you, and bringing in suffering, but you don't see Jesus swooping in in that moment to save you from your suffering. Can we be honest and say to ourselves, there will be real questions in these moments of suffering. We have to be honest when suffering comes, when demonic uh, oppression comes and actually arrives that we'll struggle to trust. We struggle to, to trust and to believe in Jesus. And so Peter does for us a few things here in verses 10 and 11. He looks straight into the eyes of suffering and without explaining it, explaining it away, he answers that suffering to its face. In verse 10, he says, after you've suffered for a little while. What is a little while? That's a matter of context. It's a matter of perspective. He says, after you've suffered for a little while, the God of grace who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. To him be the dominion forever and ever. Amen. Why is the response of faith in Christ's victory to this oppression, to this opposition, to this suffering a reasonable and right response? Well, because our faith is a faith that is couched, that is seated in an etor eternal glory of a gracious God whose dominion is universal and eternal and whose victory is secured. Look, Satan might appear like a roaring lion. He prowls around like a roaring lion. However, we have the lion of the tribe of Judah, who is the true lion that makes Satan look like the false lion that he actually is. And in John chapter 16, Jesus tells us that at the cross, he judges Satan. In, jo in Mark chapter 3, Jesus is, is the one who comes after Satan. See, Satan is the, the strong man, but Jesus has entered the strong man's house, has bound him up, and has plundered his goods. In Genesis 3, there is a promise that Jesus' heel will be bruised on the cross, but it's that very heel that will crush the head of Satan. And so this is all captured in, in Jesus' mission in 1 John chapter 3, where it teaches us that the Son of God came to destroy, dismantle, and tear apart the works of the devil. It means that our Lord came to oppose this adversary, this one who seeks to come against us, to cut his power off, to dethrone his demonic power to chain his movements, to disrupt up his schemes, to invade and colonize his kingdom, to cast him down and cast him out, to plunder his house, to judge him, and finally crush his head. Resist him, firm in your faith, knowing that the same experiences around the world are being experienced. And after you've suffered for a little while, the God of grace, this God of grace, who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, Eternal glory is something for us to, to grab hold of. It means that as we resist the devil, firm in our faith, we do show, so with the utter assurance of Jesus' present and future victory. We don't live as those who are without hope. 
We know that the battle is won. We just need to live more like we know that the battle is won. If we believe Jesus is indeed who he said he was, and he is doing indeed what he said he would do, then we should live (coughs) with a mindset that says we know that it is already won. And we live as uh, lights for the gospel, a a beacon of the glorious grace that God has given to us and and pressed into our hearts and lives. And we pour this out in our our communities, in our lives to help show a world that so desperately needs to see the truth of what Christ has accomplished. And so as we resist the devil firm in our faith, we go on the, the attack, we go on the offensive, clinging to the truth of the gospel, knowing that all dominion will be forever his I want to point out uh, one final thing for us this morning. It's a couple of words that, that may not seem to have a great deal of importance, but they do. In verse 10, when he speaks in, in the second part of verse 10, when he says, In Christ will himself, Christ will himself perfect, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. Those two words, will himself. That Christ will himself do something amazing. That after his people suffer, and even fail that test of spiritual warfare, Jesus himself will restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish. After the enemy comes, and temptation comes, and you stumble again, and you fall again, and you sink into depression again, and it's, it, you're dealing with that fifth year of sickness, and that, that 15th setback, and that that fourth, uh, you know, reemergence of that same old sin and temptation that seems to plague your heart all the time, Jesus remains faithful. See, Jesus is not depending on you. He's made you dependent upon him. This enemy, this adversary who may seem to ex- succeed, <coughs> that may even get you to fall, maybe even get you to fail egregiously. But he can't keep Jesus from protecting his own. He can't keep him from restoring his own. So listen, whatever sin you are in this morning, whatever spiritual attack you are weathering and feeling, worn down and beat up by, whatever it is, Jesus can slay it, overcome it, and restore it from you and for you. See, when Peter denied Christ three times, he had utterly failed his spiritual battle. And yet after the resurrection, Jesus would come to him, He would come to him and he would restore him. Not only would he restore him from his grave error, he would set him to the great task of making Jesus' name known. Don't wait to come to Jesus. Don't wait to call out to him. Don't you dare not ask him for help in your time of need when you're struggling with sin or darkness or depression or sickness. Whatever your struggle may be, we come to him knowing that he is the restorer of all things clinging to the truth of the gospel and that our God is good, that he will restore us as well and bring us to a place where we can be a shining beacon light for the truth of the gospel. This is our charge this morning, church. This is what he tells us to do when we submit to God, when we resist the devil, casting our cares upon him, being sober in our mind, being on alert, recognizing that the devil is actively at work. So look with me now, church. So we recognize that there is a great deal of conflict and animosity that is currently taking place in our country and in our culture. As we look around us and we we see the world seemingly on fire in this past year, we trust in a God who is good. We trust in a God who is good and who has already won. We believe Jesus who is who he says he is and that he's going to do what he says he's going to do. The battle has been won, folks. Let's live like it has been. Let's pray. God, you are gracious and good. Help us to be those who trust in your word. Help us to be those who cling to the truth of the gospel. God, help us to resist the schemes of the devil, being prepared for his attack. And God, help us to be those that walk through this earth as good representatives, as a a light that, that shines the reflection of Christ. God, help us to be obedient to you as we walk through this world, that they may see you. And come to know the truth that we know. That Jesus is indeed the Son of God. In whose name we pray. Amen. Thank you for joining us with worship this morning. God loves you. And we do too.